Our guest tonight is Dr. Odile Madden. Now, Dr. Madden is traveling from the Getty Cons Conservation Institute, which, as many of you may be familiar, was close to the Getty fires in California last week. So we're very gracious that she could join us on uh, such a dramatic couple weeks and a couple uh, extreme weather weeks. Before we jump into a rather rich discussion here around the symbolism of plastics in our cultural heritage and how we use them in our everyday lives, it really does behoove us to start at a very basic question. What the heck is plastic anyway? So materially, we're all, of course, very familiar with plastic materials in our lives. Most notably, perhaps we see plastic water bottles in the news every day. But of course, plastics make up the cars that we drive and the tires that we drive them on. They make up the clothing that many of us are wearing this evening and the shoes on our feet. They make up the plastic bags that we take our groceries home in and the food packaging that that food comes in. But plastic chemically does have a standard definition. The term plastic refers to a uh, class of materials known as synthetic polymers. Now the term polymer can be broken down into poly and mer. The term poly meaning many, mer meaning unit. Now polymer is a chemical substance that is comprised of smaller repeating units known as monomers. So let's imagine then that a polymer is this chain link here. Each individual link is known as a monomer, one of those one units. Mono meaning one, mer meaning unit. When those individual metal links combine together side by side, they create the polymer chain. With me so far? Yeah? We'll go into just some basic chemistry, nothing too, too drastic here. So let's look at an example of a real world polymer. Let's take, for example, polyethylene, the most common plastic. It, it's, it represents roughly one third of all global plastic production each year. Now the polymer, polyethylene, comprises individual monomer units of ethylene. Ethylene is made of two carbon atoms, shown here by the letter C, and four hydrogen atoms bonded to those two carbon atoms, shown here by the letter H. Those individual monomer ethylene units can combine into a chain and comprise polyethylene. Now polyethylene, in this sense, is prized for its stretchiness. It can give quite a great deal before it breaks. And so thin films, such as saran wrap and plastic bags, are prized for this property. Higher density polyethylene is prized for its, um, for, for its, uh, what is it prized for? Thank you very much. <laughs> it can hold heavier materials and is often found to uh, control chemical substances, such as these detergent bottles here. We can make a very simple change to the polyethylene chain by substituting one of those hydrogen atoms with a chlorine atom. A simple change like this results in the production of polyvinyl chloride, or PVC. Now this material produces something that's much more dense, much more rigid. For example, it's prized in construction materials, many of our plumbing systems. We can also add additives and manipulate PVC materials further and optimize for their waterproof ability, if you like. And so for example, we use vinyl sometimes to line our waterproof boots. One other final simple substitution we can make to the polyethylene chain is by replacing all of those hydrogen atoms with fluorine atoms. This, of course, producing polytetrafluoroethylene, more commonly known as Teflon. Many of us are familiar with the high heat resistance that Teflon offers, it lines our nonstick pans, and it has also a nice insulation feature to it, so it's common in electrical apparatus. So why did I just give sort of that rapid fire example of a few common plastics? What we showed was that simple chemical manipulation of the polyethylene chain can result in drastically different materials. We can optimize for different properties. We mentioned hardness rigidity, waterproofability, maybe we'd like to consi consider recyclability. And these are all wonderful advantages that plastic chemistry certainly offers us. But I'd also put forth that this offers, this creates many disadvantages as well. Every new synthetic polymer that we create is introduced into the natural environment that has never been there before. So we don't quite know how it will degrade. How can we properly dispose of these materials if they haven't existed before? Here to tell us a little bit more about the intricacies of these problems is Dr. Odile Madden. 
Dr. Madden. Got it. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Uh, I understand it's particularly nice weather outside today, so thanks for coming inside uh, to hear our presentations. Thanks to Ra Rachel and to Larry and to the Franklin Institute for having me. This is a huge honor, and I wouldn't have missed it regardless of the fire. Uh, I wasn't going to be giving this talk. Um, so this talk is entitled Plastic Separating the Good from the Bad, partly because I don't work primarily with the bad plastic, with plastic pollution. I work with the plastics we want to save. I work with museum objects, uh, noble examples of human ingenuity that happen to be rendered in plastics. So I study the plastic we value. And then, as a person on the street, a uh, person who goes to the beach and sees the garbage, I end up seeing the plastic that we don't value. Right? And it's the same skill set and the same mindset that I bring to the two problems. Uh, it might surprise you. Does it surprise anyone to know that there are lots of plastics in every museum collection and probably zoo in the world? Good. Surprises to no one. Um, all sorts of things are made out of plastic now. And it makes sense that we'd be documenting our culture, our history, and the artists would be working in plastic as a medium. It's a really fun, uh, versatile substance. So I'm going to be talking a bit about uh, good and bad plastics. Oh, right after I talk a bit about us. Um, there's uh, the themes that are going to run through my talk, I'm hoping, even if they're not obvious, are that there's an ingenuity, and it's balanced with a responsibility. And sometimes that responsibility is harder for us to understand, and the ingenuity is harder for us to contain and rein back. Um, but as for what we do, at the Getty Conservation Institute, we're part of the J. Paul Getty Trust in Los Angeles. We study conserving cultural and artistic heritage. How do we preserve those examples for the long term? And I'm the senior scientist for a group called the Modern and Contemporary Art Research Initiative, which we call ModCon. And we're studying the history of plastic. We're looking at the oldest examples and seeing how they hold up, which is often not well. Um, and plastic is a really fast-changing landscape. Uh, polymers are constantly evolving. Additives are evolving. Processing techniques are evolving. So um, is that clock going up or down? I can't tell. There's a clock behind you. And I'm not sure if it's going up or down. Is it going up or down? Up? OK, good. Uh, it means we have a little more time. Uh, we're, as a result, we're looking at these old examples of plastics. And we're wondering what to do about them, because we have to preserve them, but they're not made anymore. So the top slide shows me making plastic with some equipment that it's called a twin screw extruder and compounder, compounder and extruder. And with that, we make plastic formulations like one we're working with is called cellulose acetate. It's basically a modified version of trees and cotton. The polymer of those is called cellulose. It's been modified with some acetate groups. We cut long strands of plastic that we make into pellets. My colleague Michael Dutry here is molding it with heat and making a dog bone shape. And this dog bone shape, we're looking at it under polarized light. Uh, it's showing us where strains, where stresses are, where the discontinuities in the rainbow are, these interference colors. This is where we're looking for stresses, uh, just to see how fabrication processes affect the longevity of the plastic. We're also interested in developing treatments for when plastics do get damaged. This is my colleague, Anna Lagana, who is working with transparent sculptures. Uh, in this case, this is a piece of polyester resin, an unsaturated polyester resin that some chips have been broken out of. It's really hard to glue these back together and get transparent again. Right? And here she's doing the same thing, trying to paint out scratches so that we don't have to keep repeatedly polishing things. So. We're made of plastic. We're just made of natural plastics. We're made of proteins, right? The world is also made full of cellulose, the world's most abundant polymer. Um, and it's modifications of these, uh, specifically of elephant ivory in the beginning, uh, trying to replace elephant ivory and tortoiseshell, that gave us our first synthetic plastics. Um, first one that is called celluloid. Has anyone heard of that? It was a brand name for something called cellulose nitrate. Um, and uh, cellulose nitrate had a big problem, had a bigger public safety problem than anything we have now. It caught on fire 
right, on its own, and it would immolate theaters full of people. It would immolate factories full of workers, and that was a problem. Uh, but we overcame it. It took about 50 years to do that. So other examples of ingenuity that have come about since then is we flew the first time. We flew. We don't have wings. We flew. In 1903, the Wright brothers fly the first powered flight in a wooden open architecture plane. But by 1969, we have people walking on the moon in self-contained plastic, largely plastic, life suits. Plastic is a, it made something amazing possible. Similar with being able to now outlive our parts. Right, these are three artificial hearts, uh, the Leota Cooley heart, one of them is the Jarvik heart, and I can't remember the other name, but these are in the Smithsonian's National Museum of American History collection. Because we can now outlive our own hearts for a while. We can replace our joints, the liners in shoulder replacements, uh, our polyethylene, really cross-linked polyethylene. This is an amazing thing. Our eyeglasses, just being able to see. And see, so you know, there was a time when you'd get eaten if you couldn't see. But now we can see and we can do all sorts of things, drive, fly, uh, read, um, that we can't do without plastic safely. Then there are uh, examples of popular culture. Barbie and Tupperware, here's where you get into the, well, is this disposable or not? Barbie, think of what she's done for shaping how the, we view women. Right? The first, this is the, an example of the first Barbie doll. It's in the National Museum of American History collection. And this is an advertisement for Tupperware, a company that made cooking ware for the home out of plastic, out of polyethylene, and has, to my knowledge, never made disposable products. This is one thing I think is a solution uh, that we should be thinking of. Part, oops, part of a complex solution is that we can use design to make plastics that we invest in rather than dispose of. As I mentioned before, the material properties of plastic are such that they're tailored to the object's purpose. So these are all things that are in Smithsonian collections in this case. Uh, a quarter pounder, foam clamshell, the spacesuits, the artificial hearts. They were only meant, they were designed for a service life of one meal, one voyage, one lifetime, right, or a part of a lifetime. But once they become museum artifacts, our challenge is that they, their service life changes because their use changes. They are now things that are supposed to represent themselves in perpetuity. Right? They're no longer going to hold hamburgers. They're no longer going to the moon, and they're no longer going to be implanted in someone. Um, but so then they're supposed to sort of last forever. And that's really, it's a huge challenge for us. There's also plastic, uh, a lot of plastic artwork that is really gorgeous. Artists have made, they really push the limits of these materials. So these are some examples without going into the names of them. Uh, these are pieces by Niki de saint a uh, French artist who these pieces she made beautiful outdoor sculptures of plastic. These are a polyester resin, I believe, and fiberglass, and then covered with a mosaic. These are outside in Washington, D.C. A lot of stress put on plastic art. Uh, and then this piece by Nam Gabo from 1927, this is what it looks like today. And these are things that are degrading all by themselves. So I can tell you plastics do go away. What do we mean by them going away? What do we need by them breaking down? Because that is broken down. We want them to disappear, to go away. We can't necessarily do that, right? This is a sculpture I love in Brazil, in a forest. The tree, it's by an artist named Matthew Barney. The tree is made of polycaprolactone, which is a biodegradable plastic. It's really fun to work with. It's really nice to work with. But now we've got a biodegradable plastic for artwork. So it's even getting harder for us to conserve these things. Now let's talk about the flip side. Marine debris is a, we've all heard of marine debris. It's a government term. It's a term of consensus uh, for talking about what is essentially marine garbage. And I'll read you the uh, formal definition is any persistent solid material that is manufactured or processed and directly or indirectly, intentionally or unintentionally, disposed of or abandoned into the marine environment or the Great Lakes. So it's a bit of a policy mouthful. And these are its impacts. When marine debris gets loose, uh, when plastics get loose in the environment, and other materials, but plastics the one we're most concerned with currently, causes economic loss. Habitat damage. Wildlife entanglement and ghost fishing. These things are so prevalent in the news now that I don't even think I need to explain them. 
Ingestion. Have you all seen these pictures of animals that eat plastic, turtles and seabirds? Um, look what's inside. It's a cigarette lighter, some bottle caps. These are largely um, consumer items, also some fishing items, packaging items, but largely they're, we did a study in our lab, uh, and they were mostly beverage bottle caps, followed by things like razors and toothbrushes and toys. Um, so we can see our role in them, and they are a problem because they cause obstructions, and not because they are necessarily toxic, because they are largely polyethylene and polypropylene, which are not toxic on their own, but it's very waxy plastic and it attracts oily things in the ocean, so they act like a pill of condensed pesticides and other poisons that get into the ocean. And one question we should be asking ourselves is, why is all this stuff in the ocean? This is a picture of vessel damage and navigation hazards when like ropes and nets get loose. This is a really dangerous job, taking the rope off of a big boat propeller. Alien species transport, these are little critters that uh, an intern in my lab photo, uh, took a, in the SEM. She found them on a plastic bottle cap that I had found on a beach. And then there's the aesthetics. We don't like it. That's valid. Um, it's very valid. Uh, so we should consider that. It's, the environment is fouled and we feel a disgust about it. So that's what I've got. These are some beautiful plastic sculpture that were at the Burning Man. Uh, two years ago and are now, or have been on exhibit at the Smithsonian. Did anyone go see that? No, they were really cool. They open and shut. They're beautiful origami pieces. But with that, bring Rachel back up. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Odile. If anyone would like to submit questions, we'd love to hear from you all. You can submit via email at speakerseries at fi.edu or you can tweet at us at hashtag TalkFI. So, Odile, you spoke to a little bit of the history of your work. You've sort of attacked the plastic crisis from two different angles here. You've considered environmental ramifications, and you ended there on marine debris, for example. And now you've studied plastic in preservation and conservation, and how its degradation can be problematic to the conservation of cultural products. Um, why make the switch between the two? Why start, where did you start, let's say, and, and why begin studying plastic degradation as it pertains to conservation? Uh, professionally, I started working in the museum context. So I was an art conservator who turned out to really like the science side of it. And I went back to school and for a PhD in material science and engineering. Uh, so any material scientists here? How many of you are scientists? Okay, a whole bunch in this town, yeah. There are an awful lot of chemists in this town. Um, so I was working in the museum context, and it's a, I do a lot of Raman spectroscopy, and one challenge I was seeing with Raman spectrometers for the museum is that these things, this instrument can identify plastics. It can tell me what kind of plastic I've got. And from there, I, I go to the beach a lot. I see the plastic around me, and I thought, huh, you know, I'm not hearing anything about what kind of plastic it is. And so I took my museum work and an analytical tool I was using and then realized that I could do something environmental with it as well. You mentioned Raman spectrometry there. For those of yeah. us unfamiliar with this technique, it can be used to help identify what types of plastics are which. And I think that this is something that's really interesting and germane to the conversation. It's challenging in the first place just to identify what a plastic is made of. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah it, it really is. There are um, all sorts of polymers, like Rachel showed a few, like polyethylene, polyvinyl chloride. Those ones, they're among the most common commodity polymers in the world, so that's most of what we're seeing, right? Um, but there are other options, and when you're dealing over a span of, say, looking from 1850 up to today, you can't reliably, you can't infallibly determine by looking what you've got. So a Raman spectrometer shines a laser at the sample and by a, putting a detector nearby, the detector catches the light that comes back and it tells you from the color of the light, what wavelengths are collected back, what that material is. It can give a good idea. In the best days, it works that way. Um, are we always yeah. able to characterize materials in such a way? Sometimes it's really hard. The more old the plastic gets, the harder it is. Uh, as the plastic oxidizes, especially with Raman, things also fluoresce a lot. So, anyone do ramen here? 
Okay, materials tend to, they give off a broad light called fluorescence, and that fluorescence obscures the Raman peaks that I'm looking for. So as they get older and dirtier, they get harder to analyze. Okay. So we have to chemically analyze the materials that we're trying to preserve such that we can understand how to preserve them. Yeah, and we don't There's do that with things like recycling. Okay. So if you think about recycling, we've got resin codes now on the underside of things. Like they're, uh, resin codes don't say anything about the additives. So it gives you the polymer, but doesn't say what else is there, right? And a lot of things don't have resin codes on them. So the idea of not being able to know, not knowing instantly what plastic you have, and then the idea of mixing them all together, melting them back down, and hoping to get a goo that performs like the original material did, that's challenging. This is one reason why you see 30% post-consumer recycled content for some materials. A lot of, in a lot of cases, new material is added to give those material properties, get the material properties back up to snuff mm. um, because of contamination, because you can't tell what you've got, mm -hmm. either for time or because it's hard to determine. So you've, you've brought up recycling, and certainly there's a number of questions I would imagine floating around. Um, some of these are a little bit process-based, but let's talk about plastic degradation in the environment to okay. start. Um, one audience member says, I've heard plastics take hundreds of years to degrade. How do you determine the degradation rate, especially given that many environmental variables and plastic material characteristics exist? Degradation rates are hard. Uh, it's hard to come up with something. Like, it takes hundreds of years, but the earliest plastics, the earliest synthetic plastics, are, what, 170 years old? So they're necessarily projecting forward, right? And it takes 100, 100 years to degrade in what environment? Like, okay, even biodegradable plastics should, it, when you look at the conditions under which they would biodegrade quickly, like if you could collect them and they would biodegrade in a controlled situation, it's usually warm. I believe it's sometimes moist. Um, but it's not floating in the ocean, like somewhere that's cold. It's not up in snow. Uh, it's not buried under dirt. Or maybe it is. Those are biodegradable things, degradable by microbes, maybe. So it varies a lot. So what happens is one can do controlled tests on the material in question. Like, that's why we have equipment to make our samples. And then you age it. We, in our lab, we take generally very clean things and we heat them, we expose them to light, either visible light or UV light. We cycle the humidity up and down and then we measure various properties and we see how those properties decline. Um, and then we try to extrapolate, we don't, yeah, we try to extrapolate a bit how long it will take for something to degrade. But sometimes you hear a statistic in the news and then that just keeps following, like, by anecdote. Sure. So it seems then that many of the experiments that you and your lab are doing in the conservation context apply pretty directly then to understanding environmental degradation. Yeah, we study process. failure. We hope, we don't hope for failure, but we study it. Yeah, That's, it's really, it's really, it's similar, it's analogous. Um, yeah, and it's interesting, it's just that we see that things break. Like, what does breakdown mean? What does it mean when, you see, plastics never go away. What does that mean? At what point have they disappeared enough for people? Like, because to my mind, the thing is broken in 100 pieces. Is that not gone away enough when it's in the environment? How disappeared do you need it to be? when I think of it from the environmental perspective. Like, what do you think? Well, let's delve into that a little bit. Okay. When you say disappeared, are we talking about pure aesthetics here? I mean, many of us are probably familiar with the formation of microplastics. We hear about these certainly in, in news headlines and emerging scientific findings. And can you tell us a little bit about the issue of microplastics specifically? Okay, so what I consider an issue, this is my opinion, but I believe microplastics are plastics that are plastic fragments that are smaller than a half centimeter in any dire direction. Um, they are broken pieces of bigger plastic objects. Um, and somehow they got into the news and they got more terrifying than the whole objects. They got really scary. They can be ingested by more species. So things like obstructions, if you think just about animals ingesting plastic, they kind of have to be size matched. 
So you things go in and then they come back out. If anyone has had a toddler who ate something, you hope it comes out, <laughs> right? So certain animals can eat certain things. You don't expect a seabird to be able to void out a toothbrush. Like that's too big. But a little fragment of microplastic, maybe, maybe that'll come out, maybe that won't get stuck. But if it's some kind of worm, well, okay, that's too much. If it's a crab, those pieces are probably too much. So there's a size matching. And eventually these plastics can break down to where they're the size of like krill. And then they get very hard to filter out mm -hmm. of the ocean. Mm -hmm. um, so microplastics, it's, one kind of has to think of the, what's the impact you're trying to, that you're worried about. Because mm -hmm. a lot of these things like polyethylene, they're not, polyethylene is not in itself toxic and it wouldn't break down into something that is toxic. Mm -hmm. So what's the worry mm -hmm. and address that. She mentioned earlier that smaller plastics, the surface of plastics, can act as sorption surfaces. So you mentioned that pollutants can sorb to or stick to the surface of, in this case, microplastics. So this is of, of grave concern to many environmental scientists because these materials can be ingested at the lowest levels of the food chain and bioaccumulate. And then they move up the, yeah, they move up the food chain. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, eating sardines, great. Eating tuna, not great. Mm -hmm. Now that kind of worry. Um, again, there's the question of why is the stuff in the water in the first place? And I don't, so I hear a lot about, I hear a lot of, this will be not totally on topic, but I hear a lot of panic working with plastics. Like, plastics never go away. And people get, like, again, a lot of agitated conversations. If I do a professional day at a table where the public comes by, I'm bombarded with people and don't get a snack until well over it after it's done. <laughs> people are very upset. And they want to tell me their experiences. So there's this real emotional worry about it. Um, that's, that's a challenge because plastic's not evil. Plastic's just stuff. In my world, it's just stuff. Metal is stuff, concrete is stuff. It's plastic is stuff that we make, we choose how to make it. And it's so formable, it's so versatile. We can make it into so many things and we can choose to make noble things out of it. We can choose to make things that are beautiful and durable that we value, that we hand down. Does anyone have a cake taker, a Tupperware cake taker? Do you have one? Did you buy it yourself, do you know, or did you inherit it? Was it handed down? You bought it? So do you know what a cake taker is? Tupperware makes these. It's a, a Tupperware container for, with a tray and a lid over it, and you put a cake on it. Uh, you put a cake on the tray, and then you can enclose it and then handle it, bring it to a party, say. And a cake taker is one of those things that if you leave your cake taker at a picnic, you call the next day and you find out who has your cake taker. <laughs> you go pick that thing up, right? And I know that cake takers, you know, Somebody passes away and the offspring say, I want the cake taker. <laughs> like this happens. So you can hand down plastics, right? There are other cultures that have not gone the route of disposable things. Uh, we're doing a project now, just starting. Uh, uh, so right now, a baby project, a collaboration study of um, the plastics of East Germany. And we're focusing on uh, household things. Um, and it, just from the first couple essays I've read, the beginning of the Cold War starts. You see two cultures diverging, right? But they both have plastic in this moment. And a few decades in, we go the route of making disposable stuff. Our stuff gets, from what I see in old trade magazines, our stuff, there's a moment where we start declining in quality. We go away from the melamine plates that can feed a whole cafeteria of people. We move away from that to, there are substandard people, people who are making substandard products and they're not strong enough to be used and we in the profession are upset about that to, hey, you know what? I can make lots of these things fast. How great would it be? I've got all this capacity. How great would it be if I could get them to use a fork, or use something, throw it away and then buy an identical one? And then all of a sudden the failing thing got to be commercially valuable. It looks like, the first essays I've been reading about the East German plastics is that they didn't go that direction. They, 
watch, I'll find out later that this is completely wrong. But in my first two essays I've read, there was a bigger push perhaps to say, look what we can make out of this. We can improve upon what's already there. Look how advanced we are. Look how successful our culture is. And that's a, geo that's a political argument. But look how successful we are. So they made plastics that are beautiful. They made beautiful plastic furniture, beautiful plastic um, coffee sets, say. Um, so there's a potential, you have the potential in good design to really value a plastic object. It doesn't have to be disposable. And disposability, it starts in around 1945, 1950, and then really takes off in the 70s. I see then it was, there was this perfusion of ballpoint pens and diapers and razors and things. Mm. Um, you see it all from the ads in old trade journals. Sure. But um, anyway, we have the option to make things with good design that we keep. I've forgotten what the question was, but it felt very important to tell you all that. <laughs> so, no, this is interesting because in, in so far as design can invite certain valuing of objects or certain usage of objects, can we design materials, plastic or otherwise, to value the object differently or to use the object differently. And so, I don't know, could we, could we design a plastic object that demands recycling from the user? How can we, how can we sort of push that, that cultural practice envelope by designing products? The way? demands recycling. Does that? Or demands a certain behavior writ large. Yeah, okay, so handing something down, it's valuable. It's beautiful. Your children remember it as the beautiful chair that they always got to sit in, the fun one. Um, the cake taker, something that's very useful, um, brings back memories and is valuable. Uh, and as things become more rare, there's something called rubbish theory, whereby um, when you get a lot of something, it loses its value because there are too many of them. And then you know, they fall out of fashion, but then you get fewer and fewer and fewer and fewer of them. And then they get rare. And then the value starts to go back up. So often that happens with heirloom objects. So there's that. Um, in terms of recycling, I don't think it's the design phase. One would need to think about the materials that you're making, because you have to recycle. It needs a certain recipe repeated again and again and again. Um, so one could make something more recyclable. But if you don't mandate recycling and aggregating of the material, recycling will never make sense. So talking to colleagues, um, there's a man named Mike Biddle who runs a company, um, MB, MBA Plastics, MBI, Pla Mike Biddle Plastics. Um, and he has a recycling program for plastics that's worldwide. He started the company out of Northern California. I think it was around Oakland. And he now has operations around the world. He has no plastic manufacturing in the United States because we don't aggregate our plastics. Other countries do. They aggregate all the, ref all the refrigerator liners, all the computer cases, all the cell phones. They have figured out a way at a civic level. They've made uh, yeah, a, an administrative and engineering system that favors aggregating. So if you want something to be recyclable, it's not just somebody's going to science it. Like It also has to be done at many other levels in the way we live. Cultural, it comes down to culture. Lots of questions about recycling here, one of them. Oh god, okay. <laughs> oh, that's right, you guys are all, are you all tweeting as this goes on? Oh yes. Oh, this is so strange, we're, okay. We're all here together. All right, all right. <laughs> one question is, is conversion of synthetic polymers to fuels or other polymers a practical and sustainable option for plastic disposal? It happens. They call it, they, um, yeah, fuel programs. It does happen. I think with recycling, when you, can't, um, when you can't aggregate it and get it pure, one option is to burn it. There's a lot of chemical energy held in that plastic, so it's done. Sometimes it's done on the sides of beaches, of islands, that island nations that don't have uh, any more room. So the garbage pile gets burned. Um, that is an uncontrolled environment. So you'll find pieces of sort of mush, I have found, seen pieces of really mushed up melty plastics. I'm like, it's, it's biodegrading. Did something, it was in an albatross, actually, it was in an animal. I was like, does the albatross break it down this way? No, it's the remains of a fire. It's a piece that didn't burn completely. But then you've got the whole issue of burning stuff, right? 
There are other situations, like I believe Hawaii has had or still has a Nets to Energy program that was funded jointly with NOAA, where fishing nets are converted into energy that fuels hundreds of houses, um, the electrical needs of hundreds of houses. Fishing nets, uh, are, commercial fishing nets are huge, and they're made of very heavy plastic, and they are very expensive. They are also very expensive to um, dispose of. So let's say a fishing net gets loose, a piece of it tears off, it goes ghost fishing. It keeps catching stuff, uh, which is what happens. Um, and it eventually, some good meaning citizen finds it, and they take it to the recycling plant in, say, Seward, Alaska. The landfill will possibly present you for, with a bill for several thousand dollars. You got to pay to dump stuff, right? So, and also, it's fouled. It's dirty, it's oxidized, it's got stuff growing on it. It's not great for recycling. So, but you can burn it. And in that case, the idea is to catch the emissions, capture the heat, capture the emissions, um, and generate whatever form of, uh, yeah, of power you want. With that. So a lot. So it can be done responsibly, I think. Sure. So many more recycling questions, but I'd like to actually put a pin in that conversation because it seems like what we're going to continue coming back to is that it requires systemic change, in addition to individual choices here. Is mm -hmm. that fair to say? I think so. Yeah. A question that's that's related. Um, how can material scientists help us reap the benefits of plastic in our everyday lives? without exacerbating the negative environmental impacts that plastics have. And I've used this as sort of a segue question um, because there's many other questions relating to biodegradation and how we can sort of build in easily degradable features to plastics. Okay. Um, so plastic's going to break. It's got to go away. It's got to break down. Um, it's got to do it without breaking into smaller pieces, and it's got to do it without giving off exuding toxic things, toxic chemicals. So we're very worried about phthalates, for example, bisphenol A. There doesn't mean whatever's replacing these chemicals is better. It doesn't mean it's less toxic. Um, but that is a case of a plastic breaking down. It's separating into its constituent parts. But So we don't want those to be toxic, right? So when a material scientist or a product designer is thinking about making objects, it could be useful to think about how it's going to break down. Um, is it to do it in some way that is benign? Um, and yeah. but you can't control how it ends, where it ends up. Like the designer can't control where it ends up. So that comes back to that systemic change you were putting a pin in. Um, but that's one way a material scientist can work with it. Also decide, okay, are you going to make something durable? How durable do you, under what conditions will something degrade? And if you want to make it more durable, um, yeah, I guess that comes down more to a product designer. If you want to make it more durable, uh, make something of quality, make it into, make it something that one would want to keep as opposed to something one would want to throw away. Like I have an awful lot of reusable bags at my home. Right? I try not to use the plastic ones, but I keep getting promotional ones, like prom various promotional bags that are way more durable than, and they're junk. They're way more than I could ever get. There's way more than I could ever get in groceries with these things. And I was watching, actually, I was watching whatever the Good Morning Show is with Hoda Cobb this morning, because I'm in a hotel, right? And I've got this enormous big TV. So I turned it on and I was watching the Good Morning Shows. And there was Hoda talking with, um, whoever the co-host was that day, but they were showing the Christmas gifts for the Christmas gifts rush is on. And one of the big Christmas gifts to give right now is sets of reusable straws. Like, oh, so we're making, we're now banning disposable straws, but we're making more durable ones that to the best of my knowledge, no one wants to use. I, mean, I don't, I mean, does, does any, I, I'm actually curious, how many people want to use their disposable straws and clean them? How many of you are honestly doing it? Okay, great, so maybe 5%, 10%. If we can learn to use disposable straws, great, or reusable straws, great. But otherwise, we're making durable straws that people are going to throw away, which is a problem. 
So I don't know how the material scientist and the, poly, and the product designer fit into that, but yeah, there's, yeah, so there's something there. Hmm? We're talking about needing behavior change also. Yeah. How can we do I that? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I have never felt so powerful and so terrified. Um, how do we do that? We have these peculiar habits. So I showed a picture of the foam clamshell hamburger box, right? Fast food is kind of a peculiar habit if you consider a time when people sat down and ate dinner together, right? When we sat and ate at the table. Um, this idea that we, and fast food has facilitated lots of things. You can have families that work late and can still feed their kids. You can make food that's inexpensive. Um, there are benefits to it, but also, we don't sit, we now eat on the run. And it's because we're very busy, but we have this peculiar habit of walk and also needing our food on the run. There are costs associated with that because it's wrapped. Like we love to walk around with beverages. And I've lived in Tucson. There people will remind you in the street, do you have your water? Because you do need your water there. But we don't all need beverages. I don't need a beverage with me all day long in a disposable bottle. We also have a peculiar habit of walking in the United States of walking around with warm beverages. And if you think about it, yeah, we love to drink a coffee on the go, but it's weird. Like having to walk around with a hot drink is a, it's a bit peculiar and it's only a recent phenomenon. So might it be useful to encourage sitting maybe and having a conversation at a cafe where they use a porcelain cup? Like, could we bring that back? Would we maybe reap some benefits in other aspects of our lives if we did things like that? Um, yeah, I think those are the kinds of cultural changes. Like, if we need so many bags for a bag ban, what are we putting in the bags? Like, why do we need to have so much stuff when we go shopping that, ah, could a market basket take care of it? Like, I don't know, and so you'd say, well, well, no, I need to feed my family for the week because then I go, to, you know, I go to work and I've got to do it all at once. Okay, but so it sort of makes this cascade of how we live changes that get us back to the not needing so much disposable stuff. Like, so I think thinking in those ways is going to be helpful in the long run, I hope. All that from the cheeseburger. Yeah, all that from the, all that from the foam clamshell. Yeah but, yeah, but the idea of this, you know, the drink covers the... The, I don't want to call out any company because there are so many now, but the plastic disposable warm beverage lids. Those are peculiar. Indeed. <laughs> <laughs> so let's transition here. I, I think the next question as it pertains to your work at the Getty is, is really intriguing. What art object most represents the beauty of the unique properties and use of plastics as a medium? Ooh, there are a lot of examples. Um, in California, in Southern California, we see a lot of um, art from the light and space movement. Is anyone familiar with that? So, thank you. It's a, a movement from, oh gosh, when did it start? Let's say 50s, 60s, 70s, um, in California where there's a lot of aerospace production. Aerospace, aerospace was the biggest industry, I believe, in California for a long time. Uh, and there was a lot of plastic making and resin making that was happening. And artists began to get that resin. So basically a resin is a liquid or two liquids or a solid that can be melted to flow that make a plastic, right? So these resins were being purchased by artists and made into these beautiful transparent forms that captured light in interesting ways. They transmitted it, they reflected it, they concentrated it at a point by reflecting it, like say if it's a parabolic mirror type shape. Um, they did that, and there are also these kind of ideal shapes. So we have one in the lab by uh, an artist named Fred Ebersley, and it is a parabolic mirror that is a cylinder on the outside with a parabolic mirror on the inside. Um, and it's gorgeous. It's like if you were to take a, imagine the shape, the shape that you wanted to draw on graph paper 
in the days of graph paper, the J, you want to try making CAD. Imagine if it were real. It makes that, and it makes it in this quite um, almost ethereal way, except it's substantive. So it's a neat concept of playing with light and being a solid ideal form. And the challenges these things have is that over time, they're going to develop some kind of patina um, because they're going to get scratched from handling and stuff. And then they become, there comes, one challenge we have is that there comes a moment where you see the scratches and then it's not an ideal shape anymore because you're busy looking at the scratches. So a lot of what we're doing is trying to figure out how to keep the, keep the beauty. Um, yeah, these of what are con currently expected to be pristine objects. Sure. So I guess in, in the grand scheme of things as a conservator, you might hope that plastics continue to degrade <laughs> for job security. Yeah, for job security. <laughs> there are so many jobs in the arts. <laughs> no, I'm really fortunate, and I have more than enough for my career. Um, but materials will continue to evolve, and we will continue to need to preserve them. Yes. So I think these mysteries will continue. With or without, I would like plastics to become, to evolve towards more stability. Another uh, question related to your work at the Getty. Yeah. How is knowledge of plastics affecting museum decisions on acquisitions? Ooh. I don't know. I can't speak for all museums, but it's a challenge. You've got um, this artwork of the moment that may be more fragile than other things, but there's lots of fragile stuff in museums. I think works on paper, uh, fragile textiles with light-sensitive dyes, things made of glass. Uh, they're very fragile, so and museums collect those. And with the plastics, um, I don't know. It depends, but there are certainly there are challenges in collecting them and maintaining them for the long term. And it, a new object, you don't necessarily know what that object's going to do because the material's new. So there's one I work with a plastic called cellulose acetate. Uh, modification of trees um, and it we've got it stored cold we know what humidity we like to keep it at so the main problems the main chemical degradation issues are taken care of we know to keep the light levels low the, so the main issues are taken care of but 60 years later some subset of these just break and turn into a gravel they just sort of explode one day and they're littering the floor and that's a challenge. So you don't know what something's going to do 60 years out. And I don't know how you collect for that. But yeah. Do you think it's your responsibility to reconstruct the product if it explodes? We talk about that. So reproduction of new, uh, reproduction of contemporary artworks. Sometimes that's, it, it depends. It's a complex discussion that happens with an artist or an artist's foundation if the artist is no longer living uh, with museum curators. But sometimes in the face of a damaged object, uh, or damaged meaning something's happened to it, like acute, or it's just degraded, um, it no longer serves its function. Yeah, the idea of reproducing it does, it does happen. Um, but then, yeah, there are all these questions of, I'm not preserving the original material, and so do we keep that one and have a new reproduction one? Will people accept it as being as valuable and as interesting as the original? Um, I was at Mount Vernon, uh, in, I lived in Washington DC for years, and I was at Mount Vernon one day and I was in the slave quarters that had a fire years ago, and it's a brick building. And there was a fire that burned this thing down, uh, and it was rebuilt. And I heard a tour come through as I was in there, and there was so much interesting stuff to look at. There were bunk beds, and they were double bunk beds, and um, there were examples of food on the floor and toys, and it was really... Um, painful to look at and interesting. And the tour guide said, you know, in this building, I heard her say, the building burned down years ago and it's been rebuilt. And you can see three original courses of bricks over in the corner. And it is structurally the least interesting thing off in the dark. But everyone who was on this tour was like, oh, the original build, those are the originals. Those are, that's the original, that's the real building. They were all of a sudden torn, they were drawn to that. So the idea of the original, like in our culture, in the United States, we have a fascination with things that are real, real 
um, being uh, the original fabric being somehow more valuable than anything reproduced after it. Uh, it's just, yeah, it's another peculiar thing. It's almost like a time machine that takes you back more effectively than a reproduction would. Um, yeah. It appeals to our nostalgia. Yeah, somehow in a way that, so it, with, repeat, with reproducing artwork, will people accept it? Um, but often things are remade. So let's take a little bit of a diversion here. There's several questions coming up asking to draw the distinction between natural and synthetic materials. Um, we also have a request to discuss natural plastic filaments like bamboo. Uh, I have this cup I bought at MIT in the gift shop and it says that it's a bamboo cup and it's not. It's bits of bamboo that are in a plastic resin that they did not name. <laughs> It doesn't describe it, but it's called a bamboo cup, and it has all this marketing all over it that says that it's, um, yeah, it's made of, it's somehow green. It's a green cup because it's made of bamboo, but there's no mention of the fact that it's gray and it's plastic. Um, so <laughs> it's very interesting to me. So I bought it, of course, and brought it home, and it has one of those peculiar silicone plastic lids, so it's got a reusable plastic lid for a hot beverage. Um, but natural versus synthetic. Tough. Um, what's natural? Like the law of conservation of matter says that everything here is natural, right? So, okay, natural polymers, our proteins, um, those are natural. I have heard, however, um, scientists, paleontologists, in fact, uh, one telling me that our nitrogen, some surprising amount, percentage of the nitrogen in our protein is now actually isotopically, it can be shown that it is derived from synthetic ammonia, um, <laughs> synthetic ammonia fertilizers. So are we, but we consider ourselves natural. Um, I'll call natural polymers proteins, grow, proteins that are grown, cellulose, uh, those are examples. Um, the proteins, like structural proteins, Keratin, collagen, fibroin in the case of spider webs, um, albumin from eggs, those are all um, natural proteins. But those don't make a really good goo. So when we started making, we could carve things like that, like an elephant tusk. Um, you can carve X number of billiard balls and comb housings out of that, right? Because you're limited by the shape of the tusk. So wouldn't it be cool if you could make all that natural cellulose into a goo? Well, cellulose nitrate comes along. It gets dissolved. Cellulose gets dissolved in cellulose nitrate um, by a man named Edward Benedictus, I think, was uh, the first to notice that. Oh, no, he made the first safety glass. Oh, there's a long, fuzzy uh, evolution here. But so cellulose gets modified with nitric acid and makes a goo. And voila, you can dissolve it and paint it out. Um, as a coating uh, for, say, early textile-covered airplanes. You can mix it with camphor and make it into something moldable. It's cellulose, but with the side groups have been changed. But the polymer is made by nature, right? It grew. So people will call those semi-synthetic plastics. In textbooks, they'll tend to call, and in my field, we tend to call them semi-synthetic plastics. But they could just as easily be called semi-natural, right? Earlier, pl plastics slightly before that were made out of um, things that we'd consider plastic are made out of shellac, which is an insect secretion. Blood mixed with, I think, sawdust makes something, I believe it's called bois d'urcy. Uh, there's uh, other tree resins. Rubber comes out of a tree. There was a big rubber boom in the 19th century where everybody was getting into buying rubber. And you could like put it on your raincoats. I think you could make boots out of it. But there was this problem. When it got hot, it got sticky. And when it got cold, it got brittle. And then it would rot, and it would smell really awful. And so this bubble kind of burst until um, Charles Goodyear is, uh, is generally given the accolades for vulcanizing rubber. So make these little sulfur bridges in between the rubber polymer uh, molecules. And all of a sudden, we can make tires out of it and galoshes that don't melt on a warm day. So 
is that natural or is that synthetic? Um, yeah, and so you bring this up to today where I hear people talking about plant. There were these, for a while there were these, um, I'd see it on websites for plastic companies. There would be this hand, a pair of hands holding this little sprout in some dirt. <laughs> and it was talking about plastic coming from plants. Well, I think what they mean generally is either, they mean cellulose acetate. They might mean cellulose nitrate, but it catches on fire. Um, and rayon, which is a recon or cellophane, which is a reconstituted cellulose as well. They're coming back, and we're calling them natural. I know from making cellulose acetate things that you can't injection mold it without a plasticizer, and that plasticizer tends to be a phthalate, unless they come up with something else. So is that natural? That's where we see the little seedlings, you know, the seedling hands. Um, but it's, you know, once, it's really tough. Like, the first polymer that's considered, I think, that gets the credits for being fully synthetic is Bakelite. That would be, if it's phenolformaldehyde. Um, yeah, where the polymer chain was synthesized from smaller monomers in a factory. So. I'd love to ask the next question, but I'm still sort of boiling here about the nitrogen in my DNA. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Better life through chemistry. <laughs> Better living through chemistry. Another question. Sorry, it's nitrogen that was already there. It was fixed from the atmosphere yes. by chemistry. Oh, yes. I don't know if that makes me feel better. <laughs> <laughs> Many questions remaining um, as they relate to an earlier conversation. Plastics management and plastics recycling. Thinking of older man-made materials like glass or ceramic, are there any lessons we can learn from how humans have successfully or unsuccessfully managed the life cycle of a product or material that might inform our management of plastics? Mm. This is interesting. Yes. Um, OK, bear with me. I know I'm long-winded and will tell you a few stories. But there's a professor at the University of Maryland College Park named Robert Friedel. And he's written a lot about the history of plastics. And a while back, some few years ago, I think, he wrote, started writing about the concept of convenience. And he would say, like, convenient for whom? Like, we have all these convenient products. Um, and he talked about the, uh, uh, the evolution of beverage, the move from beverage containers that get reused to beverage containers that get thrown away and recycling, recycled. I remember. I grew up, my first years of my life were in Australia, and I remember the milk being delivered in a glass bottle. I also remember that what we called lemonade, which was essentially what in the US is seven up or Sprite, you could order bottles of it, and it would come in reusable bottles. Um, you'd put back the empties, and the milkman would come, and he'd leave you new ones, right? And you could bring back, for you know, decades, you could bring back a bottle of milk to the store or a soda bottle, glass one, back to the shop and you'd get your deposit money back. This is in the United States as well. You get your deposit money back, and they would refill the bottle. They didn't break the bottle. Um, so glass bottles, yeah, you can make glass. glass. Making glass into objects takes a lot of energy. It takes a lot of heat. So does plastic. So imagine with the plastic bottle, you take it, the soda bottle, um, you Take it and to the sh you take it, you throw it away. It gets collected somehow. Someone redeems it for cash. It either gets it gets taken somewhere, then it gets washed, it gets chopped up, and then it gets mixed together with maybe some new material, and then it gets melted and made into a new bottle, an identical one. Like we don't wash them anymore. When I was on the same trip to, I was in Zanzibar years ago, they still washed the bottles. I would get these beautifully aged glass bottles of soda tongo, uh, stony tongo wheezy, amazing ginger ale. Um, but there are parts of the world that still do this, but we don't allow it. And one reason we don't allow it, uh, it's inconvenient for stores, right? They have to collect all of these sticky bottles and hang on to them until someone comes and gets them and takes them back to the shop. So. In the time of, I think it predates aluminum cans, there became a concept of the one-way container, where you didn't have to bring it back anymore. And 
for reasons that it was basically inconvenient to have to take it back and refill it. Um, inconvenient for whom? Don't know. But that's when you see a lot of litter starting. So litter, we see plastic litter, but it didn't start with plastic litter. Um, metal litter was a problem, and litter, you'd start seeing these one-way containers by the roadside uh, in vacant lots. Those were tossed aside. So the idea of, there are some old habits that commercially it would be hard to maybe convert back to them, but the idea of refilling and reusing is very interesting. Um, that's one. Um, another would be uh, McDonald's in, uh, which decade is it? Is it 1990? They um, moved away from the foam clamshell container for, uh, because it was a polystyrene container. And they moved away from that for a, in exchange for a paper wrapper. Uh, does anyone remember this happening? I do. The um, paper wrapper is not good at keeping a hamburger warm, right? And if you were to think about putting a hot hamburger in a napkin or a piece of paper, copy paper, it would get soggy and yucky. It would be a horrible holder for a hamburger. And yet these wrappers hold your hamburger surprisingly well, even if they don't keep it warm. It's not just paper. It's paper laminated with plastics. So that, you know, it's a modified, not recyclable paper. But this was all on the front page of, I believe, the New York Times. It was very big news that they were moving away from this. And the reasoning for it was, at the time, we were very worried about the hole in the ozone layer. Um, and this, was, this hole was being exacerbated by the CFCs, the chlorofluorocarbons. The, to make a foam, you take a plastic, uh, and you blow bubbles in it, essentially. And you need a gas to do that. So the gases that were being used to blow the bubbles were also exacerbating the hole in the ozone layer. So fine, there was a pretty quick engineering fix for that, switch the gas. And so today I think you mainly see pentane, uh, which has uh, got its own problems. It potentially has greenhouse gas capability, but at the time it was better than the CFCs. So that problem had gone away by the time McDonald's does away with the, the foam clamshell. But the public is still very upset about styrofoam because they're upset about, they're upset because they understand the hole in the ozone layer. Um, they're upset about, they're not so upset at that time about toxicity, but because people were so upset about polystyrene and thought of it as evil, it was determined by McDonald's that it was better and more popular to go for a paper wrapper that is not paper, that took up, there's a man named Hawking who did a full life cycle analysis of polystyrene drinking cup, coffee cup, versus a paper cup. And he showed that the polystyrene cup, because it doesn't take a whole lot of um, plastic material because it's got so much air in it, um, it required significantly less water, it created less pollution, um, it costs less to make it, it was a better, more environmentally friendly, e more easily landfillable material uh, than the paper wrapper. Uh, the paper wrapper makes much more volume as well. It can be, can't be compacted in the same way. So we have this sort of affinity for hating plastic. We like things that are natural. And we make these emotional decisions that sometimes are not helpful. And it's really hard to make decisions in conditions of uncertainty. We don't have all the answers, and we, I know we're really clamoring to have them, but it's important to think about the, I really love bamboo, it's renewable, and not noticing that it's a gray plastic, this looks like a plastic cup. Like, I thought about this for a long time, like, could it be bamboo? <laughs> like, is there some way? No, it's not bamboo. Um, and, you know, getting rid of wrappers to create another environmental problem because we're afraid, that's a lesson to learn. Like fear moves us to make change. Um, discomfort and anger lead us to make change. Doesn't mean that it makes the best decisions about what that change should be. So. So in wrapping up here, you're sort okay. of, that last response was circling around a lot of environmentalist messaging and maybe a little bit of advocacy messaging as well I was sort of picking up on there. Um, so 
a day born of, of advocacy energy is Earth Day. And here at TFI, we're thinking about planning for the upcoming 50th anniversary of Earth Day. So if you could leave us here with your recommendations on where you'd like the conversation around plastics to go as we enter the 50th anniversary of Earth Day. I am one of many. I am one of a whole room of people who wants to come up with better solutions. So I'll, do, I'll try this. Um, I want to see, it needs to be an all of the above approach. Like everyone in this room can do something to make this problem better. We can, on an individual level, we can use less. Um, the scientists perhaps can favor making things with a better cradle to grave uh, life cycle, um, a more benign one. Um, there've got to be cultural changes, like, and some of them we make at an individual level or at a family level, like going to sit and have the meal with the proper plates, um, proper plates, porcelain plates, melamine plates, fine. Um, melamine fell out of favor because it's not microwavable. So around 1980, you see melamine just like not interesting anymore, but it makes a very good cafeteria plate. Um, so no problems there, reusable plates. Um, making those kinds of changes and then culturally at a more systemic level, like there are um, cellulose nitrate, the plastic that caught on fire. It took about 50, 60 years to solve the problem. They very quickly had um, a uh, new polymer, cellulose acetate, to replace it. But they couldn't ramp, production couldn't be ramped up quickly enough, right? So it takes decades to get to that point. World War I intervenes. Um, but engineering controls became necessary. There were rules in factories about not smoking, um, care taken that way. There was the projection room became, uh, there were only, the projectors were changed so that only a certain amount of film could be exposed to the light bulb, the heating light bulb at a time. So the projectionists were licensed. The projectors are now specialized. The room was constructed in a special way with concrete and big teak doors so it wasn't able to spread a fire. Right? So these are engineering controls. There was a toilet installed in the projectionist room, so the projectionist really had no excuse to ever leave the film unattended, right? So there are workplace behavioral controls. These, you know, lots of people in the workplace were involved in making these kinds of decisions. Um, that was important. And then there were regulations. The insurance industry uh, wouldn't underwrite under certain conditions. They started driving change. So, Everybody had a role. You could not carry the stuff on the metro. You could not carry the stuff on a train. You had to cover it. You had to have it in certain boxes. Everyone has a role to play. So I'd like to see the cultural discussion start to be discussed. Certainly a discussing biodegradability, um, but starting to dis culturally bioplastic, the plastic that's made out of living things, where are we gonna grow that stuff? That's a cultural question, because who's not getting fed if you're not growing food on that land? Um, these kinds of cultural questions I think are really important, and if we would stop calling plastic evil and just start treating it with more responsibility, I think we would be on the right track, on a better track. Which brings us full circle to a comment you shared in your opening talk about ingenuity requiring responsibility. Yeah. How beautiful. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for bringing me back there. <laughs> Please join me in thanking Dr. Odile Mellon. Thanks, guys. Thank you.